the great success that the stars have in the USFL was because of, of, of Carl Peterson being an active general manager, like personnel guy who came over the league to no surprise in many instances, fell in love with older coaches, Chuck Fairbanks, George Allen, older coaches, Marv Levy, eventually these coaches gravitate to older players who they know. Peterson knew where all the bodies were buried from younger players. So at the beginning, he swings a number of key deals for players that you may not have ever heard of, but were young players on the rise who, for one reason or another, either didn't make an NFL team or cut. He knew them. He knew where they were. And he swung deals, even in ter- with territorial schools that were given to other USFL teams and brought those players on board. We had immediate advantages there that other that other teams didn't. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. Okay, let's do this. Hi, everybody. I'm Tim Hanlon. Thanks for joining me here on my podcast called Good Seats Still Available. And if you haven't listened before, we thank you for giving us a try. Uh, For those who have listened before, well, you know that this is the podcast that is devoted to what used to be in professional sports. Today, we're talking about something that uh, a number of our fans have been asking for, and I'm sure will be the first of many episodes to be dedicated to it. And that is the USFL, the United States Football League, uh, which existed in the early 1980s, as most of you remember, and um, uh, had some wacky times and interesting trials, shall we say. And uh, we're going to start our little journey into that league's history uh, with our guest today, Bob Moore, who is the longtime uh, public relations director for the Kansas City Chiefs of the NFL and still the historian for the team today, uh, but is most interesting to us uh, as he was the, I guess he was the third ever employee of the Philadelphia franchise of the USFL, the Philadelphia Stars. Uh, technically the Baltimore Stars in their last year of existence, Uh, but no argument that they were the most successful team in the USFL in in its brief three years in three championship games in a row, uh, winning the last two of them, uh, once as Philadelphia and once as Baltimore. Interesting stories, interesting times from our guest Bob Moore uh, in just a couple of seconds. Uh, Before we get to Mr. Moore, I do want to thank our first ever advertiser here on episode number 11 of the show, and that's Audible. Audible is the premier provider of digital audiobooks and has over 180,000 titles to choose from in just about every genre that you can think of. Audible titles play on iPhone, Kindle, Android, and more than 500 devices for listening anytime and anywhere. And uh, listeners to our beloved podcast can get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial when they go over to audibletrial.com slash goodseats. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash goodseats, and you can get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial of Audible. Uh, I can't recommend it enough. Some amazing books there uh, across many different genres. And yes, even in sports history and nonfiction, there are a ton of great titles uh, in that genre alone, but don't limit yourself to that. If you want to get to a nice spy mystery or a nice romance or even some comedy uh, or sci-fi fiction, uh, you can find it all there at Audible. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash goodseats for your free audiobook download and 30-day free trial. Thank you, Audible, for giving us a shot as our first advertiser, and uh, we look to many more episodes with you uh, in the future. Okay, so let's not uh, waste any more time. Let's get to our conversation around the USFL with Bob Moore here on the show. Uh, obviously, uh, your career as um, with the Kansas City Chiefs, very uh, uh, pronounced, uh, longtime uh, public relations director and, uh, and obviously historian uh, over that period of time. But um, a lot of what... Um, frankly, I wanted to spend some time with you on is uh, a little bit of the prelude to that, right? Which was that sort of uh, interesting time uh, that you spent as the uh, public relations director for uh, the USFL's Philadelphia and then Baltimore Stars. Um, And if there's, um, perhaps you can give our audience a bit of an understanding of how you even came to 
this fledgling football league uh, and team, you know, where were you sort of in your career at that point and, and what even convinced you that that might be a reasonably good idea? I'd been uh, in uh, sports publicity for a couple of colleges and universities. And at the time, I was at Drexel University, which is located in uh, midtown uh, Philadelphia. I had been with the National Park Service and Public Affairs at one other time. So I was in the publicity business, so to speak. But I was at Drexel University. And in Philadelphia, there are a number of Division One colleges and universities in which Drexel was one uh, and probably the least publicized at the time. I had actually just gotten there uh, not too long after I was approached by um, an owner of the new USFL. I didn't know much about it at the time. Uh, the owner in this particular case represented three other, two other men. His name was Miles Tannenbaum. And what he did is they uh, had developed Kravco which uh, was one of the largest mall develop, uh, developing companies in the United States. And there were a number of uh, other developers, as it turned out, in the USFL that were also involved in, in mall development. And something, of course, today, malls are kind of falling out of favor. And so consequently, at the time, it was a big deal. Uh, Chuck Newman had been a reporter for the Philadelphia Inquirer, who I knew pretty well, and uh, who had covered us at Drexel mentioned something to to Tannenbaum that I was a young guy and, and this would be, I'd be a guy he might want to uh, employ right away to get the word out because at that point there were no coaches, there were no players, there was nothing other than the fact that there was going to be a team in Philadelphia and it was very little known about the USFL. So I, being a young guy, agreed to do it uh, for a little bit before I would take on the full responsibility. So I didn't make any commitment right away. I just did it for a little bit leading into it, and then eventually came on board when, when they uh, hired a couple of more people. But I was the first. I turned out to be the first employee of the organization. Now, this was circa, what, uh, early 19, what, 82? This was 1982. Um, we were operating out of uh, the Kravko offices in King of Prussia. And as I said, there was just myself and Miles. As I said, you had two other partners that were involved with uh, Kravko, uh, Harold Schaefer, and um, uh, Art Powell, and there was Miles. So there were three men that were actually involved in it. So what what are your first meetings uh, with Miles and and team, quote unquote, be, be, being that there wasn't too many, weren't too many people on the team? Uh, what what was the sort of uh, what was the shorthand for what you were supposed to do, given that the fact that there was no league, no team, no players, et cetera, per se? Look, the first thing they wanted to do was clear up any problem that this was a legitimate enterprise. I mean, again, new leagues and new sports leagues, and in this particular case, it was falling on the heels of a number of years before of the old world football league. This was not going to be another world football league where money was in short supply, uh, fake attendance figures, uh, and the fact that it was pretty shoddy. But these men were, were, were very well off. They could handle the expenses and that the first things they wanted to make sure was that these guys were able to run a business like football and make a go of it. Uh, the World League, in many instances, were, were run by a number of people who didn't have the money. And so consequently, it became something of a joke. So the first thing they were trying to do was try to make sure that everybody knew that these guys were serious players in, in sports. Uh, and the fact that could spring football make it, because that was the whole basis, football in the spring. Uh, those were the major issues, and we were lucky at the time because a number of the owners uh, in the USFL were in some instances as well off as some of the owners in the NFL. So mm -hmm. that was the first major concern that that, uh, that we had to take care of, uh, that the media and the public at large would believe that this was not some sort of a, a joke or a failed project before it even began. Well, look, that's uh, that seems to be a recurring theme on, on on a lot of the exploration that we do uh, on this here podcast. Uh, again, we don't know why, but we we do pursue it, uh, and that that is a a theme, uh, a, a a part of the, I guess, the sort of family tree of forgotten teams and leagues are these owners uh, who are successful in other endeavors in their careers that, uh, for whatever reason, have this itch to. Uh, you know, a play thing, I guess, in a professional sports team or league or franchise uh, and some other, um, you know, some other way to express their 
enthusiasm for sports and given um, financial backing to do so, but are rebuffed by, say, the current ownerships of the current leagues. I, for example, I, I grew up as a kid uh, hugely uh, into the New York Cosmos uh, professional uh, North American Soccer League franchise. And that was originally, uh, you know, uh, back bankrolled by Steve Ross, then the uh, head of uh, Warner Communications. And and he wanted an NFL fr- franchise himself and uh, was rebuffed, could not get in uh, to that sort of lucky club. And, um, and you know, saw this sort of fledgling soccer thing and said, hey, maybe we can make something of that there. Um, so it, it wouldn't surprise me that uh, you had a bunch of, of, of gentlemen generally uh, looking to make their mark in professional sports and perhaps uh, not being able to do it in the more traditional way. I think that the thing that was important is that there were certainly some owners at that time who probably had that in the back of their minds. Given where some of the locations were, it was, was pretty evident that, that there was not going to be another NFL franchise, Philadelphia, for example. I mean, there wasn't going to be another NFL team in Philadelphia, and there was no question that that's where Miles Tannenbaum and his partners wanted to have their team. So there were people like that. It was only a year later, I think, where we got into the idea, specifically with the, with the sale by uh, – J. Walter Duncan, who owned the New Jersey Generals, and was also a very well-to-do oil man. He sells his team to Donald Trump, and then suddenly the whole picture changes. Uh, up until that point, there were still men involved. The most outspoken, John Bassett, who had been in the World League with a championship team, and now was the owner of Tampa Bay. He were very, very clearly wanted to remain in the spring, and then by the second year, when they got the ill-fated idea of expanding, which probably did more to hurt the league than, than anything, um, that's when things began to change. He, uh, he uh, at that point, even threatened at that time to leave the league and keep going in the spring while these other owners uh, said, okay, we'll go to the fall. But there's no doubt that there were some people in the league at that time who started, who probably had that in the back of their minds. Because there's a number of teams out there, a number of cities out there that have been spurned so many times that you almost feel sorry for them. A Birmingham, for example. I mean, they've had any number of these leagues in football, even going da- uh, back to even as soon, actually earlier, to the World League, and then later on to the World League of American Football was an NFL, you know, minor league spinoff to uh, that uh, took in European teams too. So that power, that city has lost so many teams that you almost feel sorry. Memphis is another example too. So anyway, I think that at first – Spring football was really what they were talking about. Well, we'll uh, we'll get back to uh, that sort of seminal moment uh, a little bit later, right? Because it's obviously a huge directional shift for for the league going forward, and and, and obviously rich with uh, uh, other intrigue given today's current world events. However, um, I want to kind of go back to, I guess, maybe you can walk our audience through maybe sort of your first to your recollection. Uh, getting this franchise in Philadelphia off the ground while the league itself was also fledgling and uh, and trying to make its mark by getting into uh, cities and and credibility uh, along the way. Uh, what were like what, what you must have been doing 18 different things at the same time, all hoping that at least some of those were going to stick. No. Well, the first thing, obviously, we needed to do is get to get some staff and, and to get in this particular instance, somebody to run the organization and Philadelphia being a, a tough town, to say the least. When you consider all the sports, we need, they needed to get a place to play, which meant they're going to have to get in an argument with the uh, the current uh, uh, tenants at that time of uh, Veterans Stadium, which were the uh, Phillies and the Eagles. And needless to say, neither of them wanted another tenant. So that was a major part. Uh, and had to go all the way to the city council, especially with Leonard Toes, who was fighting them all the way. And the Phillies, who probably were a little bit more generous in their in their complaints, but uh, it was nothing personal from Bill Giles, who, who ran the ran the Phillies at that time. So that was a problem. There was no coach. There was no general manager. There were no marketing people. There was there was nobody. And after a while, once the conversations took place with media people that that Miles and his partners were serious men, they had to get around to doing that. Uh, the stars kind of came at it a different way. They ended up hiring. Um, the coach before the general manager, which is generally not the way it goes. Uh, so they end up hiring um, George Perlis, who's been a defensive coordinator for the Steelers, and 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 that wasn't unusual. 
a lot of the coaches that came over, the most obvious place would be that come over from the NFL. Perlis had been uh, on all the Super Bowl teams, had been a defensive line coach. So he was actually hired before the general manager. Uh, Philadelphia at the time, the Eagles, uh, it was a Dick Vermeil era, and the the guy who was most responsible for the personnel at that time, and really had been the the man who built up the organization. Because when Dick Vermeil came to the Eagles, they really didn't have many draft picks; they'd all been traded away. So he had to put together a roster of free agents, and uh, and what and what have you to to make much of a team. So Carl Peterson, who was his personnel guy was the one that certainly after a few, about four or five years, they were already in the Super Bowl. So uh, he had shown, nobody believed that Carl Peterson was going to come over and join the USFL team. No one. I, I don't think anybody in the city at the time did. And shortly thereafter, uh, Miles came to me and said, we're going to have a press conference. And uh, the press conference was going to be to announce Carl Peterson as the uh, general manager and president and George Perlis as the head coach. Peterson at that point had looked into the idea that I better look into the fact that Perlis should be the head coach before I take the job. And he did. So it was a big day uh, in center city when they announced that. In fact, uh, as I recall, Philadelphia Inquirer, it looked like the, the kind of type that would, would be uh, war ends in Europe when Peterson came over because Peterson was considered the real grab at that point. So Peterson and Perlis are announced as the, uh, as the, the new leaders of the franchise and jam-packed press conference uh, not too far from city hall and then came the fight to get the um to get the stadium and that went on for a while with the city council and of course philadelphia city council famous for fist fights and everything else that taken place there but in this instance miles prevailed and uh we were uh, we got ourselves a lease for, so for the stadium so that 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 sounds to me like that that was sort of your credibility inflection point yeah, there's no question. There's no question. The, the credibility of getting uh, Peterson, at least in Philadelphia, was even a bigger deal than getting Perlis. Of course, almost instantly, <laughs> disaster struck because we're only in it a few months. Uh, I'm in the office one day and Perlis and I are supposed to speak at the University of Delaware, which at that time was one of our one of the schools we were allowed to have a sole pick from. They had been a Division II power at that point. And I don't want to get into too much detail on how the league uh, came up with all these different schools that each each team got a chance to be the exclusive owner of all the players that came out of there. And Perlis doesn't show up. Perlis is gone. It turns out he accepts the job as, as head coach of his alma mater, Michigan State, and he goes back to Michigan State and takes a number of assistants that he had hired at that point with him. So now we're stuck with a, with our first with another crisis, which is the general manager is there, but the head coach is gone. So we're in no position now that it, it looks like right away that we're, we're involved in some, some issues. We also sued them at the time too. Miles sues the university for, uh, for taking the guy and they eventually settle uh, out of court and uh, pay the losses that, that, that the, the team had suffered from the fact that Perlis had gone. But the real important part was I remember Chet Simmons, who was the commissioner, had been named the commissioner, the former ESPN president. And uh, he came out and said, you know, we've taken a hit, but it would have been far worse if Peterson had gone because Peterson was really the link to the city and to Vermeil and to the success the Eagles had had. So keeping him was important. But now we had to go find another coach. And that was a, that was another issue. And, and this was this, this was now how long before the season was actually going to start? <laughs> In some instances, we were just months away. We were just months away. And as it turned out. The uh, the coach who was selected was Jim Mora, who actually called the franchise. His interest wasn't in the job. It was to nominate or to talk up another, I recommend another guy who I recall being, um, I can't think of his name, but he was with the, uh, was with a, uh, but a Penn State assistant at one time. And Miles had made a run at Joe Paterno at, at, at the same time too. <laughs> to be a head coach, but Paterno wasn't, you know, he would flirt with these franchises and it actually come close to taking the Steelers uh, job a number of years before. So uh, Peterson Moore had been uh, on the staff at Vermeil's staff way back when at UCLA. Moore at that time was the defensive coordinator at the Patriots under Ron Meyer. 
And anyway, he talks him into, um, well, you know, what about you? What about you? And eventually Moore says, okay, I'll take the job. The only coach we had on the staff at the time was Joe Pendry. Uh, Joe Pendry had, had been perilous as hire, but he had just come from Michigan state. He'd been the offensive coordinator there. So he wasn't in mind to go back to Michigan state to be the offensive coordinator job he already held when, when, so there was just Joe Pendry was the only person along with myself, Leo Carlin, who had come over, uh, had one time been the business manager of the Eagles and he was a business manager of the uh, stars now. So he came over and the staff just got put together up until some instances more had never met a couple of them when we went to training camp in February in the land, Florida, some of these coaches, by the way, then go on to become some of the most successful coaches in the national football league. This staff turned out to be one of the great staffs uh, that you'd find on any uh, professional football team. And some of them were being added virtually unknown, unseen. They just, Jim talked to them on the phone and I got like Jim Skipper, Jim Skipper is now the running back coach for, for uh, Carolina. Uh, Jim had never met him, but he spoke to him and (laughs) he became the, became the running backs coach. And we had other coaches that joined us. Some of them Jim knew, some of them he didn't know uh, that came on. But they later became, in many instances, very successful NFL assistants. And two or three of them became head coaches in the National Football League. Dom Capers, who came over as a defensive backs coach. Uh, Vince Tobin, who came in from Canada. He had been fired by, the, I think, the BC Lions as a defensive coordinator. He comes over and joins him, and then he later becomes head coach of the uh, Chicago um, Bears after um, uh, Ditka leaves. Sure. And so we have uh, these other coaches that come over. So it, it just goes to show you that given opportunity, uh, some coaches who you may have just never heard of or dismissed or never got a chance, that's what this new league was able to do. But, yeah, it was a very difficult time. When, when you go to camp and you never met – and you're trying to put together game plans uh, or try to put together, you know, your playbooks. Uh, this stuff was being thrown together at the time. Now, how, how about the how about the players? Now, you, you did touch upon before sort of the territorial rights thing, which seems to be kind of an innovation, I guess, at the time where, you know, as a I guess a hastener to get uh, teams to somewhat uh, play by some kind of rules aside from drafting. Uh, and picking off from uh, from NFL and CFL uh, franchises, this sort of territorial idea where regionally you have some kind of protection or lock on players that uh, are, are at uh, universities that are uh, potentially of interest and or uh, worthwhile and, and um, you know, first shot, I guess, at those players. Um, h- how did the team kind of come together player wise? then? Well, it, it, the territorial, I can't tell you how they ever put it together because we had North Carolina. I understand Penn State, but why did we get North Carolina? Because out of North Carolina, we got a lot of really good players, uh, Kelvin Bryan being, being the best. The great success that the Stars have in the USFL was because of, of, of Carl Peterson being an active general manager-like personnel guy who came over. The league to no surprise, in many instances, fell in love with older coaches, Chuck Fairbanks, George Allen, older coaches, Marv Levy eventually. These coaches gravitate to older players who they know. Peterson knew where all the bodies were buried from younger players. So at the beginning, he swings a number of key deals for players that you may not have ever heard of but were young players on the rise who for one reason or another either didn't make an NFL team or cut. He knew them, he knew where they were, and he swung deals even in ter- with territorial schools that were given to other USFL teams and brought those players on board. We had immediate advantages there that other, that other teams didn't. And you can see that as the other teams begin to load up on older players who had been NFL guys, maybe had been cut or retired or what have you. They were enamored with those players. So we have an immediate advantage because Peterson goes out and grabs a lot of guys who, although maybe people didn't know about uh, that, uh, that he did. And it helped us right away. The other thing was he also built from the inside out. He built from lines, offensive and defensive lines. So in the first draft, that the stars have, he immediately takes Bardotes, 
and Irv Eatman. Both players go on to play in fairly long careers in the NFL. So those are the first two draft picks. So right away, he goes out and begins to load up on draft picks who come from on an offensive line and a defensive line. So those were the advantages. Those are the advantages that the stars had. And I think it's the most important advantage of, of why the stars were successful and, and say more successful than anybody else. All right. But you hadn't hit the field yet. And you're, you know, you're, no. you're, you're, you're the public relations steward, if you will, of this team <laughs> that still hasn't hit the field yeah. yet. At, at what point uh, do you feel personally comfortable or, or, or did you ever, uh, in the the weeks leading up to uh, the first game and the first couple of games with actual product on the field, uh, did you ever question your sanity along the way? Well, yeah, but you're young and, you know, you're dealing with people who are young like you. So I think youth in this particular instance probably allows you to just be excited about the whole thing. The great thing about the USFL and the great thing about all these young, these new enterprises, that most of the people that are involved in many instances, especially on the stars, we're all young people. And so consequently, uh, you don't worry about things. You just think it's going to be an exciting enterprise. Now, as far as how successful you're going to be, that's another story because in 1982 and 83, there are no preseason games, no scheduled preseason games, nothing. So you can't play a bunch of games before the regular season and come out and say, well, I think we're really good. We did have some workouts against some other teams. And, and in 1983, the first year, we weren't very good in them. We worked out, as I recall, against Birmingham. All these training camps, by the way, were in Florida. So everybody's down in Florida getting ready for the spring season, which was going to begin, I believe, the first weekend was March 6th, 1983. So you're down there in February trying to find a roster, trying to stumble around, see what you're going to get with a bunch of players who you don't know much about in this particular case. We worked out against a week before, two weeks before the season began, we worked out against Tampa, and we played the game, as I recall, in Orlando. At the, I think it was the Tangerine Bowl or whatever it's called there. We get killed. It was terrible. We, the defense gets pushed around, and, and we're going against Spurrier. That's, he's throwing the ball about every – Spurrier is the head coach of Tampa Bay, sure. and he's going with John Reeves as a quarterback. Another old guy, by the way, but you know, a guy who had been in the NFL, and we get torn up. So the defense – and then begins to carry the moniker of the doghouse defense, which is where it came from because it was so awful. We didn't have any preseason games, so we really didn't know, uh, you know how good the team was. And then the season begins uh, the first weekend in March, and you begin to see just exactly how good you're going to be. We start on the road in Denver on a beautiful sunny day that turns into a snowstorm the night before the game. We get like 12, 13 inches of snow or something. You had to clear the field, so it was it was a uh, a wild start. A team eventually we win, and defense in this particular instance uh, wins a game for us. So the defense uh, at that point uh, turns out to be much better than we thought. And then the next week we play at home opener at the Vet against the uh, the Jersey Generals and and their top guy um, Herschel Walker, who had come over in a blockbuster deal. Sure. Um, and as a Heisman Trophy winner, forego his uh, senior year and, and jumps on with the with the New Jersey Generals. We crush him twenty five to nothing, and suddenly you know the, the whole city is kind of pumped up because the Eagles at this point are going in the opposite direction. And so, whereas you got about a pretty good crowd, fifty some thousand, I think, for that opener, you certainly aren't anywhere around the attendance you're going to get for an Eagles game, but as the Eagles are beginning to slide this new idea, this new football team, Hey, there might be something about it there. So it's a great start for the franchise, uh, given where we thought we might've been when we played that preseason game. When did you think that you, uh, were perhaps onto something that could be of championship, uh, caliber during that season? Well, I think right away because the team runs out to a, to a pretty fast start. We, we lose, down in Tampa, as I recall, but then following week after the Jersey game, we go down to Birmingham and they have a pretty good team. They have cribs. They have, they have a, a pretty good uh, offensive team and a nice crowd on a cold night in, in Birmingham at Legion field. And we win that game. So we get off to a pretty fast start and it turns out we're really in command of the, uh, of the, uh, of our division, which was Atlantic division, which had New Jersey in it. And, 
I'd have to go back and take a look. I can't remember some of the other teams in our own division, but it was certainly a smaller league than, than it would be the next year. So it, right away, it was very clear. This was a team that was based on defensive strength, which even in today's NFL, today's professional football, despite the enthusiasm one feels for offense, defense still in many instances, is the dominant reason why teams get to get into the playoffs and why they win their division and why they get even to the Super Bowl, with some exceptions. So it was pretty clear that we had a very strong defensive team and we ran the ball very well. We ran the ball very well behind Kelvin Bryant. We had a great offensive line, much as I just mentioned. And the quarterback in this particular case was Chuck Fusina, who had come over, uh, had been released by the Tampa Bay uh, Buccaneers. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't a big arm, but uh, Peterson had gone to Joe Paterno and said, you know, what do you think? And he says, you know, you're never going to be impressed by his arm. You're not going to be impressed. But all he does is win. And he had obviously been the runner up at uh, one time for the Heisman. And uh, his team, Penn State, had lost to Alabama in that famous, I think it was a Sugar Bowl game. But he was a very competent, smart, heady guy and, uh, and had a great career, as it turned out. So in your role publicizing this team and, and trying to keep all the, I don't know, perhaps I'm sure some shenanigans or stories, whatever, under control, et cetera, uh, what, what is your, uh, how do you feel the press, not only in Philadelphia, but around the country, uh, was treating uh, the USFL during that first season, uh, including the television coverage, right? Obviously a shot in the arm, a huge shot in the arm uh, by having uh, ABC and ESPN coverage, right? I, I think there's no question of television coverage. You know, later on, as I as I began working for the for the Chiefs, and then fell into the role of historian as I began to close out my professional career, you really see the value of television. I mean, even in the NFL or the AFL's early days, uh, Lamar Hunt uh, knows that that the league is probably in, in a major problem. Major, not going to make it. If it doesn't hold on to it, once the ABC cancels, jumps out, and Sonny Werblin steps in and takes over the uh, Titans, who become the Jets. If it's not for Werblin, it becomes the single most important a reason that the AFL continue to exist. And brings up that famous quote you hear later on from Art Rooney: "Goes after he sees that the league signs a contract, they don't have to call us Mister anymore." Making reference to the AFL. Well, the same thing happens even a little bit earlier on too for the for the USFL. ABC gets into the business. Here's the thing you have to understand about what I learned about about professional football. Of all the professional sports that are out there that have television contracts and draw big crowds, football is the largest, but football also has the shortest season. So this plays into the the idea that if you could get a TV contract and offer more football you can attract more viewers. And that's essentially what happened with the, with the idea that you've got the former uh, head of ESPN, Chet Simmons, as your commissioner, you've got an ESPN contract, and then you've got an ABC contract. So football is something, and this is what the owners believe. The owners believed that there were certainly more people interested in football. People would watch football. And there were also a lot of players who weren't getting an opportunity to play football, and this was what the new league would do. So without question, that's, that became – and then it, by being the best team in the AF, in the uh, USFL, as, as the stars were, we were on TV more often. So even though our games in Philadelphia were being seen on TV, in those early days, that's an important part. So people were becoming more familiar with the stars. You couple that with the fact that the Eagles are going in the opposite direction. And although the crowds are not great, we're talking in the 20s and 30s in a massive stadium, more people are seeing a team that's winning and winning will draw more interest. Did you think that the press, both locally and nationally, was giving the league and your team uh, credibility that obviously you guys felt it deserved? I would say in Philadelphia it was, which I was surprised by because I didn't think we would. We had coverage from uh, uh, all the major publications. This was a period of time when newspapers were still carrying the, the load of coverage. And uh, everybody was coming out uh, to cover, to, to see the team, to see the team. The best team in Philadelphia at the time was probably the 76ers, who at that point was the 
they won a championship later on. Um, the Phillies were getting better. Uh, as I said, the Eagles were not going anywhere. And, and at that particular point, the Flyers weren't, that wasn't their best team either. So uh, we were getting a lot of coverage. Now, nationwide, they're going to cover the fact that the crowds are small. But in cities that didn't have football, uh, the crowds were pretty decent. Um, uh, Birmingham, I keep using that as an example, but that was a pretty, that was pretty well uh, attended. They, were, they, had pretty good, they had pretty good attendance. A lot of these cities, Memphis later on the second year had good, had good attendance. Uh, the Generals, obviously with Herschel Walker, had fairly de- decent attendance. So I would say that on the whole, Tampa Bay being pretty successful too, on the whole, coverage wasn't bad. Actually, coverage got worse with the expansion. Coverage then became it became diluted, and you had some terrible teams. The thing you're trying to fight off is the fact that people aren't getting paid. There's shenanigans going on, and that really doesn't take place in the USFL the first year. And it really, if you take a look at the league over the three years, it didn't really start happening until the Express in Los Angeles. Uh, spend too much money and then the not the nonsense that took place down in, in uh, San Antonio. But the first years, I think coverage was pretty good. At least it wasn't Philadelphia. I know that for a fact. Well, so <clears throat> let's, uh, you know, as we sort of, obviously the stars, you know, came up just a little short in the, in the championship game that first year, but in the off season though, it does seem the 83, 84 off season. Uh, it seems that perhaps some of those first uh, maybe financial shenanigans or question marks or over, paying for things and players and expenses seems to kind of maybe in retrospect or maybe actually in your day to day is starting to actually show itself, right? I mean, the generals uh, famously obviously sold to this, uh, uh, you know, uh, brash, uh, <laughs> shall we call him a yeah. uh, real yeah. estate entrepreneur yeah. in New York, right? Uh, uh, Mr. Trump and, and there's some other shifts and, and, and uh, uh, you know, transfers and, and, uh, teams coming and going as well, right? So you, you had to have a little bit of a pause there, or did you think that was just normal, you know, first year, you know, jinx, jitters? Uh, I, I think the I think the the problems the league was facing by the second year was that they were they were getting criticized that there weren't any good quarterbacks in the league, and um, that sends people uh, quarterback being the, the, the premier position in, in football, pro football especially. The league takes a lot of hits. When I mean, you get people like Jim Kelly involved in the league, you get uh, Young involved, and so that begins to change. That begins to change uh, what the picture of the league is. And in many of these instances, they're they're uh, guys like Jim Kelly come in. They're throwing they're throwing about every other play, so it becomes a pretty much of a wide open uh, uh, offensive uh, attack that begins to draw some interest. So right away, getting quarterbacks was, was one of the big, bigger criticisms. The biggest mistake, which I've mentioned before, is the expansion, which completely someone loses their mind and goes out and adds all these teams. And and some of them were were good ones. I mean, you're, if you're going to get Eddie DeBartolo involved, and I'm talking about senior, not junior, and he gets involved and, and, and gets a team in Pittsburgh. Of course, people in Pittsburgh love football. Uh, are they going to love the Pittsburgh Maulers more than the Steelers? No, they're not. But in the spring, it, it, it makes sense. And so consequently, with the Barlow's money, it, it's it's not a bad idea. The, the, the problem, though, becomes, you know, in these places like Boston, who moves to New Orleans and eventually ends up in Portland um, and Orlando, which didn't really draw a lot of people. Memphis successful, but the expansion I think was the biggest mistake that that that, uh, that the league had made. Would would you have thought that it would have been better to sort of stay with twelve or maybe maybe one or two more teams versus uh, adding six more so soon after just one season? Well, no question, six was was way over the top, and and I think at that particular point there were still cities, there were still states that didn't have it that would support it. Arizona, Birmingham, and Arizona didn't come till later on. So, you know, they were still playing in St. Louis. Um, Jacksonville, actually, at that point, would, would not have been a bad one, even though people criticize it today. But at the time, uh, Jacksonville was a college football. Uh, it was almost like Southern Georgia. So you had a lot of college fans would, be, it would, would, would come over. So I think Oklahoma, I mean, you would think, but I, I, it just it didn't happen there either. So 
I think if they would have stayed with the original and perhaps maybe added another one, Arizona, of course, was original and Birmingham was an original. Jacksonville uh, came in came in later. Memphis, I thought, was a, was a pretty good one. Again, strong ownership there, too. So ownership, I think, was the important thing and maybe continuing to play in areas of the country, sort of like the AFL had done. I mean, the AFL, when they start, there's only, there's only uh, 12 teams, and they're playing in the same places. They're playing in the Northeast, the Upper Midwest, and on the Far West Coast. There's no teams in the South. There's no teams in the Lower Midwest, and there's no teams in the Southwest. So that's one of the things that the AFL did to draw interest. That football was a much bigger sport than just the classic birthplaces of baseball and so forth. So, yeah, I think there's no question that they that was the biggest mistake, though, going out and, and – getting all these teams, especially places like San Antonio. You have no idea how, how awful it was to play in San Antonio. And I like San Antonio. I don't think it's the same place that they're, that they're talking about pro football today. We were playing in a uh, place called the Alamo Stadium. And I'm telling you, it was a high school stadium. We dressed, I recall, we guys were getting taped outside on benches. And to make the league minimum of seats, there were folding chairs in the end zones. And what would happen would be, there was no one sitting there, by the way. And what would happen is that the guy would go into the end zone for a catch a pass and he would terribly crash into all these chairs. They would go tumbling, tumbling down. No, it was, it was, it was an amazing, it, it looked like something from some, some sort of period of time when um, you were playing in like sort of minor leagues. It was just, it was awful. And the players didn't get paid. And then the stories began to, to come out. The San Antonio team then began the stories about this league doesn't pay its players. Uh, guys are, are running out of practice and getting their checks cashed right away because they're afraid it's going to bounce if they wait too long. They're actually in their uniforms heading to the bank. And that becomes the narrative around the league. And it hurts the league, even though none of us, at these, most of these other franchises, we all got paid. There was nothing shoddy about it, but we all know what media jump onto, which is the negative story, and that was certainly about as bad as it could be. Okay, friends, sorry for the interruption. Just wanted to quickly remind you that today's episode of Good Seat Still Available is brought to you by our friends at Audible the premier provider of digital audiobooks with over 180,000 titles to choose from in just about every genre you can think of. Audible titles play on iPhone, Kindle, Android, and more than 500 devices and MP3 players for listening anytime, anywhere. And for a limited time, my audience can listen to a free download of any book that they choose, as well as get a 30-day free trial when you go to audibletrial.com slash goodseats. That's audibletrial.com slash goodseats. And you can choose from over 180,000 titles, as we said, including uh, one that I'm listening to right now. It's called The Ten Gallon War by John Eisenberg. That's the story of the NFL's Cowboys, the AFL's Texans, and the feud for Dallas's pro football future. Um, another one on my list, which I have yet to download, but is on my queue, uh, that could be interesting to our audience here is called The National Forgotten League by Dan Daly, entertaining stories and observations from pro football's first 50 years. Those are just two of the many thousands of titles to choose from, and not just in sports history, but you name the genre that uh, you might want to listen to, and Audible's got it. By the way, two, uh, two guests, perhaps, that we'll have on the show, hopefully sometime soon. But again, go to audibletrial.com slash goodseats for your free 30-day trial, as well as your free audiobook download to try it out for yourself. Again, that's Trial dot com slash good seats and now back to our conversation but well, well, you guys though were still despite all those uh maybe rumblings or or initial sort of question marks um still obviously were quite stable both in terms of uh, off the field and especially on the field going into 84 right i mean you guys had a oh championship season that year right yes we did a championship season and we sort of take up i mean the championship game by the way in 83 is is, is, is as good a championship game as you get i mean it was, it was a good exciting game with nfl caliber players who 
were proven to be NFL caliber players years later when they went into the NFL. It was an exciting game. And it comes down to, you know, final drives. And um, that's, that's the thing that decided it. And, and you know, obviously the, the, the stars, we were crushed by the fact that we lost, but there was no doubt that it was an exciting game. And so 84 begins, you know, with a chance that, you know, we're going to take it up. The 84 season, when you look at pro sports today, is especially for football, is a very long season. We played 19 games that year. Here's a, an irony is Peterson now goes over and bolsters the defensive line by picking up Pete Kugler. Kugler, former Penn State player, has played a full season with the um, San Francisco 49ers who go to the Super Bowl. So Kugler, in effect, is playing almost two and plus seasons in a single year. He plays an entire NFL season, takes a little bit of a break, Super Bowl and then comes at the Super Bowl and then comes back and he joins the stars in training camp in February. Now think about that. He plays the entire uh, season in the, in the USFL too. And he goes into the playoffs and we play uh, three games in the playoffs. We win the championship. And the day after the championship, we're scheduled to go to England to play a exhibition game at Wembley. At that point, Cougar says, I can't go anymore. I don't want to play any more games this year. And Peterson and, and the team give him a break. He doesn't have to go. This was just a strictly exhibition game that John Bassett from Tampa Bay had set up over in Wembley. And it was a great game because it was fun. We practiced it. Uh, we actually practiced at Hyde Park. And uh, it was like people walking around looking at these American players playing football. It, in 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 Hyde Park, but it was it was an exhibition game, so there wasn't anything to worry about. It wasn't like you play NFL games preseason over in Europe to, in the past, and then go into regular season. You don't do that. We didn't do it that year, so it was a long, long season, very long season when you think about it. We only lost twice in the regular season, and those were that was to the same team, the New Jersey Generals. So we had a better record than the Generals going to the playoffs, so we get to host. But then the worst happens because we're sharing the stadium with the Phillies. Phillies have game scheduled. Phillies have first shot at the stadium. The team has to go in the playoffs and move their games to Franklin Field, which had last hosted a pro football game when the Eagles were playing there. Now, I don't know how familiar readers, listeners are to, to Franklin Field, but it's a, it's a beautiful old stadium, but it's very old. And there are no uh, single back seats; they're all bench seating. So we had to play a, we had to play our playoff games there. But it was so much fun. We had a pretty decent audience that for those games. The weather was great, and we win both games. We beat the Generals there uh, and avenge you know the two losses to them, and then beat Birmingham and make it to the final. Actually, the players after the games we had played at Franklin Field were so excited that they had almost come to the conclusion they would rather play the regular season there. So that takes us to Tampa Bay. And another good game in terms of attendance, the Stars were pretty dominant in that game. And then I think the game showed what happens when you get younger players playing in the summer because by that time we're in July. The younger players, we're marching up and down the field. George Allen's team, who now is with Arizona, is a lot of older guys. And by the, second, by the third quarter, they're gassed. And you can just see that the, the stars are pushing the ball down the field on them. And it's the game was maybe only scored three points in the game. So that sort of gave us the, the second season, but the younger players that Peters had picked up from, um, from waivers and what have you around the league um, and trades, uh, it proved his point that younger players, especially playing in the spring and summer are going to have an advantage over older players who at that point were, were pretty gassed. Well, were you surprised that uh, that the uh, the league final games uh, now t- you t- two seasons into it were played in neutral sites? I mean, that's a pretty uh, confident kind of stature versus say going with the team with the better record to host a championship game with such a young and fledgling league. Uh, the thinking was, uh, where where are you going to get your decent crowd? Denver was drawn pretty well in '83. It became a uh, you know, it sort of became an obvious place to go. Denver at that point um, was uh, had still come off the old Orange Crush teams. The Red Miller had been a coach there when they were having success. And so Denver was a, a good city to have the game being played. 
they're also following the model of, 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 uh, of the NFL in that case, with the exception being is they're playing in actual stadiums that were, were being used uh, for you know, being used by regular teams. So you could have perhaps you, you could have possibly played Denver might've been in the game and you're playing in their stadium, Tampa because of Bassett and his ability to draw fans uh, that was a natural as as well. And then of course, when you get in 85, you're playing in uh at uh, giant stadium. And that had probably as much to do with the fact that it's New York and it's Donald and everything else. And at that point, Donald probably thought he was going to be in his, his team was probably going to be in the final game, but that was the great thing about, about uh, spring league, because as the games became more important, you're playing in better weather. And so consequently um, that was one of the reasons why everybody believed that spring football could make it instead of the weather getting worse. It was actually getting better as you got down to more crucial games. All right. So let's, uh, so uh, I guess before we get into the sort of crucial off season here, um, Mm -hmm. it seems to me that, uh, and I was a kid distracted with other things in life at the time, but uh, it seems that uh, the the city really uh, reveled in the stars championship uh, with the parade and all that kind of stuff. It really almost seemed like a major sports event in the in the minds of the philadelphia sports community there's no question i mean winning winning is, is something that, that every city every city has a pro team but then it becomes the circumstances of what is the sport football very popular sport the most popular sport in the country and in philadelphia certainly probably at that point the most popular sport it wasn't that far removed from from the eagles and going to the super bowl uh the eagles aren't doing very well Stories are beginning to run in some of the local one. The Delaware County Daily Times ran a story, a fictional story of the stars playing the Eagles in a game. And they they set up the story line as if we're prepping for the game. They have lead in stories over a couple of days, a couple of weeks go on to the point that we begin to get phone calls from fans going, how can I get tickets? (laughs) <laughs> this is not, this is just a, a fake game, but people are saying, well, we want to go. We we want to go. I mean, this is still a, an NFL team playing a USFL team. So now when people are beginning to equate your chances of actually competing with an NFL team, because those stories are beginning to, to, to be free, they're showing up places. And this is still a John Ron Jaworski, still a strong team of the Eagles. So that actually helps us to a large degree. In fact, and then finally, when they write the fake game story, People were saying, well, why wasn't I, how come I couldn't go to this game? And it was just a made up game. They had the Eagles winning, but it's a close game, which, you know, gives you a little bit more credibility. So um, that becomes a bigger story. Then there's a story, it's probably apocryphal, that, that, that Miles Tannenbaum runs into Leonard Toes at, at Bookbinders, which is a classic restaurant, which doesn't exist anymore in Philadelphia, and says, you know, hey, uh, I'll bet you a million bucks my team can beat yours. And and Toes laughs. At it and, and I think Panama says, yeah, well, the only problem is I, knowing your finances that you won't have enough money to cover the bet if we do win. And whether it's true or not, I, I could believe that it probably happened knowing the two owners. But whether it happened or as, as it was stated, I, it's hard to say. But anyway, it becomes a big deal. It becomes a big deal. And, on, and as soon as it hits – the team you go into the next chapter, which is <laughs> the, the, the team's got, they're going to take their games to the fall, which, you know, just takes all the air out of our success in that city, which right. is tragic, frankly. Well, so, okay. So we're, we're going to obviously delve a lot more into the USFL in the, in the months and uh, to come on this, this mm-hmm. show. And, and I'd love to kind of get that underway with your sort of, I guess, interpretation of the drama of, uh, of that offseason and that setup to to make that shift to the fall based through your lens. And I'm sure everybody has different opinions. And and uh, we've seen the documentary on ESPN's 30 for 30. And, and you know, but but clearly uh, a pivotal moment and and not necessarily a widely or wildly majority one at that to move to the fall. No, it, it isn't. And, and, and certainly the people who are fussing most about it are the stars and asset for two because they are um, uh, playing in cities 
with NFL teams. <laughs> Where are they going to go? And uh, they also believe that the league can be successful in the spring. And there's no question that at that particular point, attendance had increased in some cities, not so much in others, specifically some of the newer cities. So there were opportunities. Uh, what's going to happen to those franchises? And so once Trump's rule in this particular case, it's been animated that perhaps that was his original intent all along to get a team in the NFL. I, I don't know whether that was the case or not, but there are certainly other owners in the league who now begin to think this is their chance in, and it's going to be something similar to what the AFL had done was to, or even if you go back to the ABA, yeah, where when the ABA folds, uh, the deal is we're going to bring some teams in. Some teams are going out. Some teams are coming in. Uh, it's interesting being the team historian for the chiefs. Now, one of the major arguments, uh, as I trolled through the, uh, the records and seeing Lamar, Lamar's notes from the actual merger with the NFL, that the deal is everybody comes in or there ain't going to be any deal. So hunt at this particular point, wants all his teams to come in or he won't make the deal. No one really talks much about that today, but that's a major deal. For, for Lamar. He's not going to abandon, he's not going to abandon his owners. So in the case of the A, in the case of the USFL, there's no way that could happen. I mean, they're not going to take in all these teams. And I think some of the owners at that point had probably made their mind up. Who cares? I mean, uh, we're going to, we're going to go in, we're going to get our team in and, you know, who cares about the other teams? And there's no doubt that would have probably happened. Yeah, we, we did a uh, an episode on the uh, our initial episode in the ABA, and um, uh, we talked with Dan Forer, who uh, did the uh, documentary on the St. Louis Spirits, and uh, right. the Silna brothers obviously were the ones who, uh, you know, were very instrumental in sort of it was uh, the league, and they kind of sort of put together this idea that indeed every every team should go, and then for whatever team is not chosen, that they would concoct this sort of. Uh, financial or economic um, uh, equity kind of opportunity that yeah. uh, uh, perversely that wound up becoming a, a a huge annuity for them and their their heirs. But um, but you, you, it, it I guess the, another way maybe to sort of ask the question I guess is was that indeed the specific fault line that is those who were in uh, cities that didn't have NFL franchises that uh, were probably maybe more in favor of it and those that were already in competitive or potentially competitive NFL cities. Uh, didn't want to because of it, or were there other uh, extenuating uh, thoughts there? Well, I think the, I think there was a changing face at that particular point. Some of the ownership groups that originally committed changed by that point. The new franchises that came in were more inclined to go along with Trump, who we can't dismiss his powerful suggestions and arguments at that point, and and even though it may be hard to believe that he had a bigger persona. Um, then that he does that he does now as president of the United States at that particular point um he was he was a pretty big figure a successful businessman or so and so he had a lot to say so there were people who were listening to him but um with all these expansion teams and and so forth uh and the fact they were playing in certain cities that always wanted to have an NFL franchise so put your put yourself in the place of a Memphis and put yourself in the place of a, of a Birmingham. These were cities that really wanted to have a professional team. And, and they were in the South and they had flirted with the old world football league. So you can imagine, and I don't know this for a fact, but you can imagine they would be in line to get an, a, an NFL franchise. They'd be pretty, pretty well excited about it. Arizona at that time didn't have a, didn't have a, uh, an NFL team. So you didn't take very many votes to swing your way. And as soon as they swung that way, Tannenbaum, Miles Tannenbaum realizes that he's not going to be able to stay there in Philadelphia, if that's going to be the case. So he begins immediately to reach out. And the most obvious place to reach out to is, is just South of Philadelphia in Baltimore. And that becomes an easy move as tough as it is for him. But, you know, it was probably similar to how tough it was for Lamar Hunt to have nowhere to, uh, to take his team out of Dallas in the old uh, AFL and move it to Kansas City because it became pretty clear at that point that Dallas couldn't support two 
pro football teams, even though at that point the chiefs were more successful than the, than the Cowboys. So, um, pretty much that's what he has to do. And it's a, it's an obvious place to go. Well, on paper, it seems like it's an easy move, but, but in reality, that move to Baltimore was not easy at all. Was it? No, it was, uh, well, folly in some instances, just because of the way it was approached in my humble opinion. Uh, we are now in a position where all the season tickets that we were going to be able to gain in Philadelphia are gone. You have a championship team. You have no, you have no opportunity to enjoy it hardly because it wasn't a short period of time later where we're moving to Baltimore. But here's another thing we're merging or no, I should say merging. The Maulers are going out of business in Pittsburgh and the Barlow is being picked up as a, a, a part owner. So uh, a pretty large figure in, in, in as far as the country is concerned, Eddie DeBarlow Sr. is coming over and we're taking a lot of his, we're taking a lot of his players. Now we benefited by a number of players, Mike Johnson, a linebacker, players like that come over to us and they are very good players. So, you know, we're going to, we're going to benefit by that because uh, Pittsburgh had certain territorial schools that, that benefited us. But, um, we have to go back down to Baltimore now and see what we can get. And I think the thing that benefits, benefits the stars is the fact we have a very strong mayor who later goes on to become the governor. He's probably one of the most beloved mayors in the country at that time, William Donald Schaefer, who's absolutely furious at the stunt that, um, that the uh, Colts had done picked up in the middle of the night and moved. So he's what he wants a team as bad as he can, because he wants to wipe out that, terrible memory. So I still remember we sit in a room in Baltimore with a number of people, business leaders, and Schaefer says, uh, okay, we're going to leave here with 15,000 season tickets. That's what we're leaving with today. So let's, let's go. Let's hear it. I mean, that's the way it's stated. And they start the business, start upping with season tickets. They're going to you know, pick up the slack and, and move it. The problem is the team, for some other reason, says, well, yeah, but we're not going to move the team. We're going to keep practicing in in Philadelphia, and uh, that's where we're going to stay. We're going to stay in Philadelphia and practice there. I couldn't believe it because I said, well, how can we begin to – why are we doing this? We're going to play in Baltimore. But we're not going to be able to play, as it turns out, in Memorial Stadium, which is where the Colts were still playing at that point. We can't play there. We can't play there until the following fall because the baseball's taking place in the spring. So we're going to play at the University of Maryland, Bird Stadium, set it at that point, seated about 45,000, which would have been fine for, for, the, for the Stars. But I found later on that Baltimore, Memorial Stadium, uh, Bird Stadium, where the Maryland plays, is also part of like Washington too. And many people in Baltimore see it as a Washington site. So here we go. We're going to practice in Philadelphia. We're going to have an office in Baltimore, but we're going to play our games in um, College Park, Maryland, which isn't really in Baltimore. So we lose all the season ticket holders that we were going to gain in Philadelphia from the move. We have a lease with the veteran stadium in the city which we're now not going to fulfill. So we're going to get pitched out of there. Team has to move its offices to the University of Pennsylvania. So after all this work and all the success that the franchise has put together over the first two years as the model franchise, we're going into 1985 on, on the, uh, in our, in our championship, off our championship season in something that is just a confused, mess. We're not playing there. We're not practicing. We're, we're not playing in Baltimore. We're not practicing there and we're trying to sell tickets. So fortunately the city has come through with a number of tickets, but again, college park ain't Baltimore. So it's a tough, tough situation really hurt us badly. Well, but it didn't on the field. And, and perhaps this is sort of the biggest sort of unsung story about, about everything, despite all of that League consternation and then specifically this team and franchise wherever it's located by the minute, right? Um, right. You won the whole damn thing again. Yeah. And we start off absolutely terrible. I mean, I will say that we were 6-7-1, I think, at one point. And, and so 
it was pretty much the same team. The team would come down the night before the game and stay at a hotel outside of, of um, College Park. We also are working with the staff at that point. For the most part, they're still our Philadelphia people. We have a terrible, for the opening game, we're going against Doug Flutie, uh, who is just, Trump has just uh, signed. So we're going to play Doug Flutie. He's coming over. It's going to be a big crowd. Traffic disaster. I mean, major problem with traffic trying to get into Bird Stadium. Got fans coming up from Baltimore. Got coming up from Baltimore. Got fans coming up from Washington. We haven't seen the team. We got season ticket holders. They're playing in a new stadium. Traffic is terrible. I bet you half the stadium didn't get in until probably the second half or the late in the first first half. So it's a catastrophe right off the bat, which hurts us coming out of the blocks. We win the game, dominate the game, and it looks like we're off to another good good season. But we stumble coming out because of all these different changes we're practicing at the University of Pennsylvania. But because of the strength of the character of the coaching and the players, we eventually overcome that and make it into the playoffs. Although we're going to play every game to get to the championship on the road, which, which we do. We play um, at giant stadium against at that point, the Jersey generals who, who are um, the division champions. We beat them pretty much dominate them. And then we absolutely blow Birmingham out down there. I mean, just defense was just incredible. And we play in the championship game, which is in giant stadium and turns out to be the final championship game of, of the, of the league's history. But again, a very competitive, all three championship games in the USFL are worthy games. They're both, they're all exciting. Um, so how do you, uh, spin the story during 85 about, you know, the league going to the fall and, you know, how do you, I'm sure that the questions and the speculation really, especially given that you're you know, basically have relocated a franchise, um, what is the theme? What is the, 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 the dominating, uh, uh narrative, I guess, uh, how do you as a public relations professional, uh, handle sort of the management of that, of that story and, in the background, lawsuit. Well, a lawsuit is, is, you know, the, the lawsuit is being pushed by the attorneys that uh, the NFL has a, as a competitive advantage. If you go back and you take a look at the history of these kind of things, even going back to the, uh, to the AFL, the early days, the AFL is involved in a number of lawsuits with the, with the NFL too, based on the fact that, that they, they're a monopoly and that other places are being denied the chance to, 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 uh, to have a league and to, and to play. And there's certainly, but other leagues out there. Um, the, the whole situation in, 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 um, in, in Maryland is actually a benefit now because the team is going to move to Memorial stadium. They're going to have a team and it's a championship team. Although, Again, what does anybody really know about the stars? They see them on TV. We actually are being covered by reporters who are forced now to who were forced in eighty four or eighty five to go all the way up to um, to um, Philadelphia to watch practices, which they don't do, by the way. I eventually had to run back and forth running video of, of practices and taking them back, conducting interviews. I'm doing stuff now that I never thought I'd have to do. We have reporters from the uh, Washington paper who refuse to cover the Baltimore team because they think it's beneath them. They're used to covering the Redskins. We're not going to cover this shoddy league. So we have a lot of disadvantages. And now you're going to go out of business for almost a whole year until you start up again. So now players are beginning to get a little antsy and and no one's quite sure that they're going to be back again. So, I do remember the final game in 85 at the USFL championship game and imagine how you feel you're in the final game and the, the players from, from uh, Oakland who were playing that game, which was a merger between the Michigan team and the Oakland team, the front office people, many instances have already been told that they're going to be let go. So this is sort of a depressed look of many staff members because they don't think even if they win the game, I mean, they're not going to be, they're not going to be employed any longer. So it's hardly the way you really want to, you really want to finish. And it was sort of a letdown to be perfectly honest with you in some instances. So it may be easier in Baltimore because 
we're now got a franchise, even though we didn't do the parade down there like the city wanted. And the whole set of circumstances going into that year are very, very difficult. As far as the as far as the trial is concerned, everything's hanging on it. And, and that's a hard thing to know because you don't know what's going to happen. And you can be confident, but what if you lose? Because at that point, you become pretty much assured that if you lose, there's going to be casualties. A lot of teams are going to go out, they're going to get dumped. And then, of course, every man for himself, you're kind of hoping maybe if that even if that happens, you'll be you'll be taken into the league. But you do. But you don't know. So did you really did you honestly believe that maybe that that final game and did others believe that that could be indeed the last game of the league? Or was that just more in hindsight now, of course, in obvious? I think there were people who believed it. There are people who believed that, that was probably everybody began to look around and say, you know, maybe we better take care of ourselves. Because then what happened is you began to lose players players began to be everybody knows that that point we started losing a few players their agents got a hold of them contracts are coming up contracts are down you think some of these owners are going to pick up and 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 sign on another contract with some of these players knowing that if we lose this case well we may not be in business anymore so they're not going to extend them. So there's waiting around. And in the meantime, we begin to lose guys. They begin to disappear. Your championship team begins to lose players. So you know how that thing works. As soon as a couple go, you begin to get a few more thinking about it. And pretty soon you begin to, you begin to lose your confidence that this is, this is really going to really going to happen. So we began to lose people, including me. I began to lose, you know, I better start thinking, you know, I mean, I'm living in, two places at that point. I live in Baltimore. I'm going back and forth to Philadelphia, but I'm living in Baltimore. We have an office in Baltimore with staff living there and, and working and selling tickets. But, you know, everybody starts thinking, you know, I, you know, we may not be able to make it. So, yeah, there, there's all sorts of doubts at that particular point. And, and remember, here's the narrative. Another failed league. You know, we've been through this before. And, and, and it was such an exciting league at that particular point. And there were so many exciting players and the NFL and the NFL teams are beginning to lift their chops because they're going to get a chance to get all these players, and and uh, even some who had been in their league and not made it, but have proven they can play pro football, maybe never given a chance. They're going to have chances to go back. So uh, it's it's pretty well uh, by that point. Uh, there's a lot of doubt. What what were your conversations like with Tannenbaum and Peterson uh, in those that last year or so? I mean, were you ever to kind of do you have any heart to hearts on sort of where things were going, or no. was it kind of like just put no. on a good face and get through the league yeah. of the year? Yeah, yeah, I, I had some because I've been the first guy, and I you know I've been there for so long that I had I had thoughts, and it changed significantly with Miles, who I've been with since since the Euros first early conversations. He sells a, a a major portion of the team to Stephen Ross. Stephen Ross, we know now, is the owner of the Miami Miami Dolphins and the stadium there. And Stephen, at that particular point, had wanted to get into pro football badly, and this is his chance. He gets to buy a championship team. So, so the owner that I had worked for all those years is, is now now gone. And I'm trying to remember when I left, but I had an opportunity to get to do something else, and. Um, I had to, I had a conversation at that point with, with Carl, who had been my mentor and who I worked with longer, even in the NFL, and anybody else. I said, you know, I got to know, you know, I mean, you think there's a shot, then I'm going to stay. But if there's not, I mean, I need to, I need to begin to have another opportunity somewhere. So I needed to take it or not. So then I eventually realized this players began to disappear, and we began to lose coaches. More is gone now. Now we have to go back in it. There's all this uncertainty. And so at that particular point, I think people began to drift away and, and it was pretty much uh, over. But it the, it had become difficult as soon as the expansion and some of these other teams and the decision to go to the fall, pretty much we had to, we, we could have continued to make it in the spring. Fall was going to be a problem. Do you think, and and then we'll sort of put a coda on your USFL career because who who wants to uh, dwell on on completely negative uh, endings here? But do, do you do you think if if um, if the league had stayed in the spring, despite its other financial issues, that it could be could have been further viable 
uh, for a period of time longer, maybe even to t- till today? Yes, it could have been. It could have been because the level of play was better. We were still getting uh, younger players. Uh, I think somewhere along the line, you would have probably had to uh, make some decisions on, you couldn't go out and do what the Express did and give Steve Young the largest contract in professional sports history and have nothing to back it up. And you you go into Los Angeles and you're playing. Eventually you move the, move the games to a junior college because you couldn't fill up the the Coliseum anymore. And and yeah, I mean, you would have had to begun to look at it a little bit different, but we've been through enough of these things to know that there's still an opportunity to draw fans. Soccer has proven that soccer proved it by moving into stadiums that could house it instead of going into these large football stadiums where, you know, the, the, the stadium looks half filled and it's, it's a downer looking around there, but now they go to their own specific stadiums and they, they continue to succeed. Look at, uh, even how long, um, something like, um, indoor football has la- had lasted. I mean, it lasted a long time. I think, yeah, it could have been And the NFL today is looking for, a uh, possibility of having some sort of system where they can develop players. While, whereas it may not have been like the USFL, the USFL could have continued to exist in that particular uh, fashion in the spring because football would have still drawn a television audience and it would have kept it alive, but not wildly expanded in these large contracts that could not have existed. It would have had to have been something a little bit different, but it would have lasted a long, longer than three years. No question. No yeah, question. It, in my it, mind. it seems like the springtime, the, the appetite for spring football, whether it was NFL caliber or, or just short of that, um, you know, just from an economic perspective, seems like it, it could have been viable. <clears throat> Excuse me. If, oh, you know, yeah, there's no question. In fact, you're still having that conversation today. The networks want more football. They don't want football to end in uh, whenever it ends. They want it to go. They need a few more months. They'd like it to be longer. I mean, the, the idea of an 18, uh, you know, game season, although players balk at it, yeah, but to this point, the, the networks are willing to pay for it. Uh, they would like more football. So, Yes, there's no question it could have continued to exist. I mean, the number of people who today tell me they saw the 1983 Stars versus Chicago, that crazy playoff game that went into, you know, another overtime, uh, and they were watching it on the beach at the Jersey Shore on little, you know, TVs and so forth that had dragged down there. It's probably a lot of these are just made up stories, but it shows that football can, can, can continue to do it. There's no question. I mean, it could have continued to do it. And it's still a conversation we have today. Well, uh, you clearly stayed in the football uh, world. Um, do you want to kind of give our listeners a little bit of a, a, a quick overview of, of what you segued into over time and, and your longer career uh, with uh, with the Chiefs and, uh, and, the, and the Hunt family? Well, I guess you could say like many of the players in the US of Bell, despite not going in there right away, um, I left for a while and went actually was a press secretary for a failed gubernatorial run uh, in in, uh, in Pennsylvania. The guy was running who I'd known and he asked me to come on board. He was also a large developer and I went and worked for him for a couple of years until I got a call from Carl Peterson who stayed employed uh through a, his contract uh, with Stephen Ross, as it turned out, uh, who had the majority owner of the, of the stars at that point. And he still worked for him. And so Carl Pearson gets a phone call that, um, that they interview him. And, and by December of 1988, he's already on board secretly and uh, with the uh, Kansas City Chiefs. At that, pat- that particular point, the Chiefs had gone through roughly 20 years in the wilderness, they had had very bad seasons and, and attendance in some instances had gone down to as low as 11,000 to 15,000 fans. Talk about the USFL, uh, in a 79,000 seat stadium in Kansas city. So memories of the great chiefs teams of the AFL days at municipal stadium are largely forgotten now. And Peterson is hired because he has proven with the Eagles and with the stars that he could build a team from scratch, which is pretty much where the 
Chiefs had found themselves at this point. So Peterson begins to put together a staff. So the obvious place he starts is people who had worked for him in the stars. I'd be one of them. And since there were only three or four of us at the beginning, he asks me and I had left at that point to, to get back in it. I didn't know we were going to Kansas city. I thought we were going somewhere else, but uh, we begin a similar rebuild now in Kansas city in the Midwest in 1989. And again, the strength of the organization is in the two top guys. And in this case, the owner, too, with Lamar Hunt and with um, Carl Peterson and with Marty Schottenheimer. So at that particular point, um, we begin probably one of the most successful decades in the last 30 years in the NFL, which the team runs off 100 victories in the decade of the 90s. You know, the only missing ingredient is a championship game and a championship Super Bowl, which I think is the biggest disappointment, but the team becomes in about four years the uh, attendance leader uh, in the NFL in one of the smallest cities in the National Football League. So uh, numbers of players come in and, and it becomes one of the great game day atmospheres in the in the league. So um, and it lasts that long, a lot longer, probably longer than one would imagine, given the fact that. If you don't win the championship somewhere along the way, that people begin to lose hope and don't go. But you know, they never seem to lose hope in Kansas City, and it goes out all that way into the 2000s when when there's another big change. Um, and you've segued uh, uh, and in parallel too as being um, uh, essentially the team historian for the for the team, uh, mm-hmm. but also uh, because of that, I guess entwined the sort of I guess the uh, curator of all the sort of uh, sports, uh, you know, uh, memorabilia and, and writings of, of the originator of Lamar Hunt. Um, have you learned, uh, what have, is there anything you've learned sort of from sort of that, those historical, uh, curations, so to speak about professional sports in general or pro football in particular, or just about, about life, I guess, uh, as you sort of segue your career into uh, semi-retirement. Yeah, I, you know, getting a chance to go into the uh, the historian element of it as I was getting into my late 60s, it gave me an opportunity to continue on and not having to chase players down a hallway to do interviews or something isn't it? It was not something I was necessarily <laughs> that interested in anymore. <laughs> and another thing you have to realize is that players get younger and as you get older, and so you need to be sure that you have young people who talk their language and, and do things. So working for the Hunt family in this particular instance uh, was a great opportunity because uh, it did give me a chance to to uh, to understand and learn a lot from Lamar Hunt's um, various sports enterprises. You know, Lamar is probably at this particular point when we think of ownership in professional sports, he is the true sportsman. His interest is is in the games themselves as much as anything else, and he was very interested in marketing the games, and so consequently. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, the whole idea of soccer's um, uh, growth in this country, in Lamar's mind, was linked to stadiums, having their own stadiums and developing developing their own players. And so consequently, uh, he was the man who generated the first stadiums, um, the first uh, soccer stadium, the one in Columbus, was built. And uh, consequently... He uh, brought that stadium that was involved in the building of one in Dallas. And so consequently, you know, he was very, very successful and he helped build that particular game and and even in something like tennis. So uh, where he was able to bring players out of the wilderness to there where they weren't making any money at all to speak of. And he changed that game. Lamar moved a lot of things by instinct. You know, he knew what he thought was the right thing to do. Not everything succeeded. A lot of things failed, and uh, but you could see things the way he saw them. Um, he was ahead of his time. He's really had a lot to do with the explosion of professional sports and attendance, specifically, and why people like sports. He saw things as big events. You know, he had ideas. He had names. Super Bowl. He's the one to come up with it. He came up with the idea of putting putting Roman numerals. Behind it, gave it a large, larger than life character. Comes up with the names of the Vince Lombardi Trophy. These are small things, but they came out of one man. So yeah, he's you learn a lot about sports 
by following Lamar. Now, not everything, not everything. I mean, he comes up with a two-point conversion, which uh, actually the USFL uh, had started. Lamar wanted to see it a long time ago. So consequently, he's out in the front of a lot of things that we take for granted today. Well, uh, Bob, I, I do uh, want to thank you for uh, regaling us in the sort of old USFL days, but also sort of a, a tip of the hat to uh, to your work uh, with the Chiefs and uh, and with the Hunt family as well. So for our, our listeners who are in the Kansas City area or uh, uh, plan a trip to, uh, you should know that Mr. Moore has been uh, essential in the, um, uh, co- the construction of and the curation of the uh, Hall of Honor and the Founders Plaza there in Arrowhead Stadium. Uh, Bob is also the, the person who is in charge and oversee in charge of and oversees all the archives for the team, as well as the, uh, the papers of, of Lamar Hunt, especially as it relates to, uh, his sporting, uh, endeavors. And I guess, Bob, one last question is, uh, I do know, and I see here in your bio that, uh, you were responsible for producing or directing or, or some other, uh, aspects of two documentaries, one basically about the life of the sporting a uh, uh, background of Lamar Hunt called Games, and in particular, specifically something called World Championship Tennis, another documentary about that pioneering effort. Um, despite my best efforts, I cannot find where those two films might be. Do you have any idea where super fans could find those? World Championship Tennis, you can get from a w- WCT site. There's actually a site, and they operate out. Games, believe it or not, uh, was a project undertaken by family members because they wanted to make sure, especially with all the people who knew Lamar, living people before they passed away, uh, were people who they wanted to make sure they would have a record of what he had done. So the grandchildren and children from the family up later on know something about Lamar Hunt. Um, I, I don't, there's actually, it's never appeared anywhere. Games has appeared on uh, various Chiefs networks, but I don't even know if we even have it where it can be purchased. W, the uh, the WCT film, however, is it, it can be seen. It's on Fox Sports a lot. It's been seen on the Tennis Channel, and it can be purchased through WCT.com, which is a uh, a site that is managed out of Dallas, uh, again, based on the uh, the fact that it's still run by the uh, the Unity Hunt people, so uh, that film premiered on Tennis Channel and on Fox Sports, especially in the Southwest region, and also in a uh, premiere at the International Tennis Hall of Fame about two years ago, uh, where a number of the early players showed up to uh, to speak about it. So, games, on the other hand, um, no one, I don't, I don't believe it. At this particular point, we have copies of it, but other than employees and, and, and VIPs and so forth, I'm not sure anybody has seen it, although it probably needs to be reproduced. It's a very long film. It's about – both films are pretty long because Lamar's had a long career. So, And we have a lot of, lot of outtakes and things from family, uh, uh, family home movies and so forth to tell the story of Lamar. And many of the people that are in, that, in the movie Games – and by the way, Games was the name that – that uh, Hunt uh, was called when he was a boy because he was always interested in games. So that became his sort of his nickname. All right. So we're going to put that out to our listeners that uh, we need to a find where games, the documentary is and B uh, try to figure out some kind of way we can get it into wider distribution or perhaps maybe yeah, an event or something around it. Yeah, I agree. So you'd be surprised that our listeners, even though we're only uh, 10, 11 episodes into this, Bob, the passion uh, is uh, palpable out there. And once we strike onto somebody else's passion, uh, they're not shy about telling us uh, how we can go further with it. I, I agree. I think it's great. I think it's great you're, with the job you're doing. Thank you very much, Bob. I can't appreciate it enough. Thank you so much. Okay, you bet. Take care now. Bye-bye. Okay, there you have it. There's our chat with Bob Moore of the uh, Kansas City Chiefs and formerly, of course, with the Philadelphia and Baltimore versions of the stars of the United States Football League, the USFL. Not the uh, last time that we're going to have conversations around the USFL and uh, a great first uh, kickoff, shall we say, for that topic. And uh, I I know I've got plenty more questions and lots of other curiosities to, uh, to uncover 
uh, about the United States Football League to come. And uh, thanks for Bob for getting us going with it. Uh, before we run, I want to remind you that uh, Good Seats Still Available dot com is open and available for your viewing pleasure. If you want to send us an email, you want to subscribe to our email newsletter, you want to get some old episodes. Uh, you want to just generally find out what's going on with the show. That's goodseatsstillavailable.com. That's the place to go, bookmark it, and uh, visit regularly. And hopefully it will be uh, worth your while to do so. Don't forget on social media, follow us there. Pick one or a few, and you'll find out uh, more about the show as well on an ongoing basis. Twitter, that's at goodseatsstill. On Instagram, at goodseatsstillavailable. Uh, you'll find us on Facebook. we got a page devoted to the show there as well. All that good stuff. Uh, Thank you a ton for listening, and uh, we look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Take care, everybody.